A great success might be interesting, but a great failure, <laughs> that's something to ponder. Howdy, I'm Steve Allen, and welcome to Snafu, situation normal, all fouled up. The 20th century was to be the age of genius. Armed with boundless optimism and an exploding technology, our heroes set out to cure disease, conquer the globe, touch the stars. The results were often grossly unintended. Somebody fumbled, blimp burst, a ship sank, and our heroes were knocked back on their drawing boards to try again. We aim so high, there's something noble in that. We often fall so far short. There's something noble in that too. Snafu will touch on every field of human endeavor where man's grasp comically exceeds his reach. What you normally see on television are great men achieving their aims. For the next hour, you'll see them falling flat on their faces. I abuse and drug addiction have been with us since the dawn of time, yet medical authorities, who now warn us of the dangers, encouraged drug abuse for years. Heinrich Dresser, head of research for the Bayer Company, discovered aspirin in 1899. The year before, he invented an even more potent painkiller, which Bayer immediately used in a variety of exciting new products. Which cough syrup did more doctors recommend than any other? Why, Bayer with heroin, of course. Doctors began prescribing heroin for poison ivy, menstrual cramps, headaches, even coughs. There are a lot of medicines that contain, that contain dangerous ingredients during the snake root oil period of the late 19th century, early 20th century, before the Food and Drug Administration got underway. Uh, all kinds of nostrums for pains or aches or uh, uh, rashes that were not only ineffective, but they were harmful for you. And literally millions of addicts were created in the 12 years it took doctors to realize that heroin was an addictive and dangerous drug. Of course, Heinrich Dresser wasn't the only distinguished doctor of his day who got high, nor was Bayer the only brand named to market a dangerous drug as an ingredient in its product. Sigmund Freud, the father of psychiatry, first became famous by introducing cocaine to the modern world. Freud believed the drug was a stimulant, an anesthetic, an aphrodisiac, and more. He called it a magical substance. When word of the distinguished Dr. Freud's discovery reached the US, American pharmaceutical companies took notice. Soon, anyone could walk into a drugstore and find cocaine-based hay fever remedies, tonics, digestive aids, pills, powders, even cigarettes, and become addicted to all of them. The best known of the cocaine-based remedies was invented in 1886 and originally sold in drugstores as a headache tonic. The pause that refreshes Coca-Cola. It was so popular that by 1909, it had inspired 69 imitation headache tonics, all containing cocaine. First of all, they thought they'd get away with it uh, because it was camouflaged by the other ingredients in the product. Uh, second, uh, a lot of times they didn't know how dangerous it was in the early days, uh, uh, but they knew that it had some sort of folk uh, um, remedy to it. You know, they want to sell, so. 7-Up, the Uncola, went a different route. Invented on the eve of the stock market crash, 7-Up promised to take the ouch out of grouch. The clear soothing drink was a huge success during the Great Depression, perhaps because it was loaded with a powerful and dangerous drug now used to treat manic depression, lithium. Lithium was listed on the label until the mid-1940s. The drug was removed from the drink after an Australian psychiatrist discovered the effect of too much lithium. <laughs> Such a thing as being too laid back. In this century, we've overcome many of the age-old problems of construction technology. The results? Sleek towers of glass and steel, long, graceful suspension bridges, beautiful and self-assured carrying us into a limitless future. However, advances in construction have been anything but smooth. Take, for example, the story of one city that aspired to great heights. Boston wanted a skyscraper. So, up went the John Hancock Tower, proudly billed as the tallest building in New England. 60 stories, nearly half as tall as the World Trade Center. Over 10,000 windows graced its facade, or did, 
until they began falling out every time the wind blew. Ingenious methods for getting the windows to stick were tried, including bubble gum, all to no avail. When the wind blew, the glass flew. Plywood panels replaced the glass. Before long, the first 33 stories of the building were completely covered with plywood on two sides. Surrounding streets had to be blocked off to protect pedestrians from falling glass. Humiliated Bostonians slunk by when passing their proud tower. The John Hancock Insurance Company explained that these were normal construction problems. Finally, a decision was reached. The plywood came down and every one of the 10,340 windows was replaced. The bill, $7 million, explained John Hancock, quote, you can't use glass without occasionally having some of it break. Leon S. Mosife was the most eminent designer of bridges in the world. He either designed or helped to design practically every major bridge in North America. The climax of his career was to be the Tacoma Narrows Bridge on the Puget Sound in Washington State. The Tacoma Narrows would be narrower, shallower, and lighter than any suspension bridge yet built, a real tour de force. But Mosife finally went a bridge too far. From the day it opened, July 1st, 1940, there was something a little strange about the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. At times, motorists saw the car in front of them appear to sink into the roadway. At other times, it appeared to vanish completely. No one was alarmed. Engineers explained to each other the advantages of the flexible suspension design. Some stays were added to give it a bit more rigidity. Meantime, motorists enjoyed the roller coaster sensation. They even gave the bridge a nickname, Galloping Gertie. And Gertie was a hit. Toll receipts ran many times higher than anticipated. Mosif was delighted. On November 7th, 1940, with just a normal wind blowing, Gertie started to sway violently. A few minutes later, the violent swaying tore loose some struts, and a 600-foot section of the bridge fell into Puget Sound. The remaining center section continued to whip about in a frenzy until it too plunged into the water. No one lost any time in fixing the blame for the collapse. All the engineers connected with the construction stepped aside and let poor old Leon Mosif take the rap. A three-man panel concluded that, quote, the fall was due to excessive oscillations caused by wind action, made possible by the extraordinary degree of flexibility of the structure and by its relatively small capacity to absorb dynamic forces. Of course, that, that must have been it. Mosife wasn't the only 20th century designer whose reach exceeded his grasp. Thomas Alva Edison tried to bridge an even larger gap from here to eternity. From the light bulb, to the phonograph, to the moving picture, Edison ranks among the most practical men who ever lived. Yet one idea Edison had never did take off, the talk to the dead machine. He actually planned to build a machine that the dearly departed would use to communicate with the living. Literally, it was to be a tube amplifier that would magnify messages from the afterworld, sort of a radio station from heaven. Edison never finished his talk to the dead machine, but he soon found a more direct route to heaven. He died in 1931. I had another talk with the German Chancellor, Herr Hitler. We regard the agreement signed last night and the Anglo-German naval agreement as symbolic of the desire of our two peoples never to go to war with one another again. again? Despite British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain's famous bedtime story, there really was a World War II, and it was the worst war in this century of war. With a living arena in which to enact their schemes, the brightest military minds soon ran amok. Many ideas should never have seen the light of a laboratory, much less the field of battle. A stunning example of British ingenuity was the ST-74 hand grenade. Now, how do you improve on a grenade? After all, a Grenades easy to operate, you pull the pin, you toss with vigor, and you duck. Very easy, at least it was when I did it in the infantry. But British scientists decided to upgrade the technology. Their version of the grenade had a special feature, an adhesive coating which enabled it to stick to the side of an enemy tank. 
It also, unfortunately, enabled it to stick to the thrower, which is usually what happened. Not to be outdone by the British, the Americans and the Russians hatched their own outrageous schemes. They used bats and dogs as weapons. As badly as it sounds, the U.S. Army actually spent over $2 million on a plan to bomb Japan with live bats during World War II. The plan, given the bizarre science fiction name Project X-Ray, was launched in 1942. And more than a million bats were captured in Texas caves. Meanwhile, a tiny time bomb was designed to clip to the wings of the bats. The plan was simple. Bats carrying tiny time bombs would be sealed in large crates and uh, dropped from planes over Japanese cities. As they neared the ground, the crates would fly open and the battalions of bats, partial to the dark, would presumably head for remote corners of the city. The simultaneous detonation of the thousands of tiny bombs would ignite the tindery wooden Japanese buildings and cause a firestorm. This ingenious idea actually worked, but in the wrong country. Several of the bat bombs escaped on a New Mexico airfield in 1943. A hangar and two trucks were incinerated. The Army scrapped the project and set out to develop a safer means of battering the enemy. But the Russians had no bats in their belfry. Instead, elite divisions of the Russian infantry recruited dogs. Almost every soldier had a canine comrade, man's best friend and all that. The dogs proved to be fearless and reliable in the field. Several were decorated for valor. But near the end of the war, the Russians took advantage of their best friends. They trained them to associate food with the underside of tanks, and then they strapped powerful explosives to their backs. The result? Dog mines intended for enemy tanks. But since the dogs were trained on the Russian tanks, they preferred them to German panzers and forced entire Russian divisions into retreat. World War II was, in many ways, the American military's finest hour, but uh, not all the time. The Nazis wanted desperately to kill FDR, never succeeded, but the U.S. Navy almost did. When FDR and his entire Joint Chiefs of Staff were aboard the USS Iowa, the ship was attacked by a blundering American destroyer, the William D. Porter. The Porter inadvertently fired a live fish directly at the Iowa. Five minutes of sheer panic ensued. The Iowa executed a series of high-speed turns, trying frantically to escape the torpedo, all to no avail. A great blast shook the Iowa to her rivets. Miraculously, the torpedo exploded when it entered the ship's wake, just yards from the hull. The president forgave the delinquent destroyer, but uh, the Japanese didn't. They sank it off Okinawa in 1945. The Americans weren't the only ones to attack themselves during World War II. The Germans also got into the act. Unlike the American Navy, the German Luftwaffe was known for its cold efficiency. The sight of the Luftwaffe overhead struck sheer terror into the heart of even the stoutest Frenchman or Brit. It seemed no gun, no missile, no prayer could stop them. In fact, when the Luftwaffe rumbled overhead, even good Germans ran for cover. On February 22nd, 1940, a Luftwaffe patrol sighted two destroyers off the coast of Borken. The plane strafed and bombed the ships, causing serious damage. After nearly an hour of pummeling, the Nazi pilots caught sight of the names of the ships. Lebrecht Maas and Max Schultz, the pride of the German Navy. But even the Luftwaffe couldn't match the Japanese in sheer determination. And one of the most determined Japanese was Lieutenant Hiru Onada. Despite a conspicuous lack of opposition, Hiru Onada fought World War II on this lovely island until March 10th, 1974. In 1945, come home letters were dropped from the sky on his remote Philippine island. But the vigilant lieutenant ignored them, certain it was just a Yankee trick. For 29 years, Hiru survived on the menu of fruit, insects, and raw fish, afraid a fire might reveal his location to the American army. And after he was found and brought home to Japan in 1974, Heru was regaled as a national hero. But still, he was skeptical. It took his incredibly frustrated wife and Japanese military authorities six months to convince him the war was really over. 
But Hiru was not the most determined Japanese soldier. Six years later, Takuma Nakamura stepped out of the Asian jungle and into the modern world. Who knows, World War II may still be going on out there, just when you thought it was safe to go back to the beach. People have got to know whether or not their president is a crook. We choose a president hoping he'll be another Washington, Jefferson, Lincoln. <laughs> Lots of luck. Sometimes he seems closer to a Larry Curly or Moe. Any discussion of modern political blunderers must include Richard Milhouse Nixon. His career wasn't so much a climbing of the political ladder as it was an escalating series of personal humiliations. In 1952, Dwight Eisenhower chose Nixon to be his vice president and then ignored him for eight long years. When Nixon ran for president in 1960, he counted on the old man's support. But when asked by reporters, exactly what Nixon had contributed to his administration, Eisenhower actually replied, give me a week, I might think of something. After being narrowly defeated in the 1960 presidential election, Nixon decided to run for governor of California. As a national figure, he expected to win easily. He lost. He wound up a bitter post-election press conference with these words. Just think how much you're gonna be messy. You don't have Nixon to kick around anymore. Ten years later, we did. And we did. I have never obstructed justice. And I think, too, that I can say that in my years of public life, that I welcome this kind of examination because people have got to know whether or not their president is a crook. Well, I'm not a crook. Nixon had all his conversations in the White House recorded to ensure his place in history. And they did. One of the tapes had an 18 and a half minute gap. Nixon's faithful secretary, Rosemary Woods, volunteered that she might have accidentally erased the tape while answering the phone. How she could have accidentally held this position for 18 and a half minutes, no one had the courage or the imagination to explain. The end result of such a defense? The greatest fall from grace in American political history. Nixon wanted to be loved, but didn't know how to go about getting it. Nixon thought he could make us love him by getting out there and winning. But, you know, we all love winners. But we love winners who play fair and who do it because they honestly beat the other guy. Winners who do it in the back door, we don't have much time for them. People say to me, Richard Nixon is uh, rehabilitated. And I say, not as long as I draw breath will he be completely rehabilitated. Of course, Richard Nixon was not the only politician to fumble his way out of the game. In fact, Nixon may have received the Republican nomination in 1968 only because the front runner, George Romney, said one little word. The people had been brainwashed. Romney was trying to make what some believed a valid point. The government had lied about the situation in Vietnam. And he, like many others, had believed those lies. But he used that one word, brainwashed. Uh, what? Brainwashed? Presidential candidate who's supposed to be in charge? Do you feel that the brainwashing uh, statement hindered you on this trip? No, no. The public didn't want a president whose mind could be tumble dry. Romney's political career was over. Similarly, President Ford's perception of foreign policy led many to question his abilities, particularly his novel view of communist-controlled Poland. I don't believe that the Romanians consider themselves dominated by the Soviet Union. I don't believe that the Poles consider themselves dominated by the Soviet Union. Each of those countries is independent, autonomous, it has its own territorial integrity. Ford lost his re-election campaign, but perhaps Ford's problem wasn't so much what he said or didn't know. It was more the way he did certain things. The way he walked, for instance. If Jerry Ford was just kind of a nice guy who did things that all of us do. That is, we hit our heads and we come up with pants that are too short and we, we sometimes make ridiculous faux pas. A rather elegant political failure was Republican presidential candidate Thomas Dewey. Cool, dapper, professional. Dewey seemed perfect. The man on top of the wedding cake, they called him. 
In his first try for the Oval Office in 1944, Dewey's opponent, President Roosevelt, looked old, tired, and vulnerable. And Dewey's supporters even had an issue, the president's dog. They charged that in the middle of World War II, Roosevelt had sent a destroyer out just to retrieve Fala, the family dog. These Republican leaders have not been content with attacks on me, or on my wife, or on my sons. No, not content with that. They now include my little dog, Fallon. <laughs> Talk of FDR being too tired to run the country stopped, and Dewey's campaign crumbled. But Dewey was certain the next election in 1948 would be his. This time, he ran against an extremely unpopular president, Harry Truman. The politicians, pundits, opinion polls, all predicted Dewey would win easily. On election night, the Chicago Tribune even published the expected results. They were wrong. Truman won a crushing victory. And Thomas Dewey, he never ran again. Every political figure, every so often, will make a fool of himself in front of the cameras. That's politics. <laughs> Candidates are not only vulnerable to the cameras, they're vulnerable to violence as well. Our last three presidents have been attacked. President Reagan was attacked by John Hinckley. President Ford was attacked twice by deranged women. And President Carter was attacked by a rabbit. Ah, the killer rabbit. Jimmy Carter was in a pond in Georgia and a rabbit tried to get into his boat. And that's a fact. Mr. Carter didn't make this up. And so he took an oar and had to try to beat the rabbit off. Who knows whether the rabbit was crazed, or rabbit or something, you know. Now, that's a very natural thing to happen. But here's the president of the United States, and we invest in our presidents this quality that they are to be superhuman. I mean, they never make a mistake, and they don't do things wrong, and they certainly don't get attacked by rabbits. Sometimes politicians get to do the attacking. Richard Nixon's first vice president, Spiro Agnew, loved to hurl insults at the press. Of course, Agnew's most venomous vituperation was... Natering Nabob of Negativism. Well, that's a phrase that Bill Sapphire wrote for Spiro T. Agnew to say. And Agnew made the most of it. Some thought the line sounded brilliant. I thought it sounded dumb. It has a catchy ring to it, but I don't think it means anything. Despite Agnew's expansive vocabulary, most politicians take a just-folks approach. And no one does that better than George Bush. Here, the vice president tries to relate to the common man and winds up in the gutter. The shortest distance between two points, of course, is a straight line. And yet, the heroes of 20th century transportation have often traveled in circles. Henry Ford, the man who put America on wheels, had an even bolder vision of the future of transportation. Beans. Ford was nuts over soybeans. He dreamed of developing a line of sleek cars made entirely from the little legumes. His bean dream cost the Ford company great embarrassment and nearly a billion dollars. At the peak of Ford's soybean craze, his company was developing over 50 varieties of the plant on 10,000 acres and buying an additional 1 million bushels yearly from farmers. During the 1930s, the Ford company opened three processing plants where soybean extract was made into paint and plastic parts for Ford cars. Here we see two Ford employees demonstrating the remarkable resilience of a car made almost entirely from soybeans. Sometimes even the old man himself took a whack at his bean dream. <laughs> that was one tough bean. Ford appeared at the 1934 Century of Progress Fair wearing a suit and tie woven entirely from soy fabric. The luncheon his company served was a soybean feast, featuring a puree of soybean, soybean croquettes, soybean milk, soybean coffee, and soybean cookies. The soybean feast got rave reviews, but American consumers found the soybean car more than a little hard to swallow. Not one was sold. After Henry Ford's fiasco with the lugubrious legume, the new leaders of the Ford company vowed to build cars they were sure the public wanted. 
Then Ford set out to build this American dream car in all new plants designed especially for it. A huge advertising campaign began. The nation waited eagerly for what Ford would unveil. The sophisticated new executives at Ford finally made one concession to the memory of the man who founded the company. They named the car after his son, Edsel. This is the Edsel, unlike any other car you've ever seen. The Edsel was an immediate disaster. After promising the world a lion, Ford had unleashed a sickly $300 million mouse. Suddenly, the sophisticated new Ford executives began looking back on the soybean car with nostalgia. Just as the Edsel was running out of gas, gigantic General Motors came out with a revolutionary car of its own, the Corvair. Sleek, fast, and powerful, the Corvair purrs for the girl, GM said. A few industry mouthpieces noted the car's instability, but they built it as a challenge to the driver's ability, not as a danger. And no one seemed to notice the car's quirky little tendency to spin out of control. No one, that is, except an obscure young government lawyer named Ralph Nader. It was a unique uh, design for American cars. It had the engine in the uh, rear, and therefore uh, it uh, raised a potential stability problem uh, around curves and uh, in certain crosswind uh, situations. Around corners, for example, the rear end would swing away and it would roll over. But the Corvair had even worse problems with the steering column. The steering column started about an inch or so from the leading surface of the front tire. So if you had a left front collision in your Corvair, the steering column would be uh, pushed right back into your chest. Nader's observations were not news to GM. They based their decisions not on safety, but rather on money. They, they, they thought it was a few dollars more uh, expensive per Corvair. So they didn't go with a dual-link suspension system. They went with the Corvair-style system against, I might add, the objections of some of the leading suspension engineers inside General Motors itself. The top executives at GM couldn't understand why Nader was knocking their product, just because it was defective. <laughs> After all, nobody had ever complained before. When the whole affair became public, though, a scandalized GM apologized and brought Corvair production to a screeching halt. While the soybean car, the Edsel, and the Corvair never quite got rolling, the airplane soared, and then it crashed. Wilbur and Orville Wright were not only responsible for inventing the airplane, they invented the airplane accident. September 17, 1908 was just another afternoon aloft for Orville Wright, but in mid-flight, he lost his propeller and the plane crashed. His sole passenger, Lieutenant Thomas E. Selfridge, did not survive the crash. They probably lost his luggage, too. While Americans were devising exotic ways to go places, the British were thinking of exotic places to go. Take, for example, the legendary explorer, Captain Robert Falcon Scott. His spirit was indefatigable. His courage and fortitude, legendary. He was, of course, a total failure. In 1911, no man had yet set foot on the South Pole. With full support of king and country, the proud Robert Scott set out to claim the pole for England. At about that time, a Norwegian explorer named Roald Amundsen also departed for the South Pole, declaring a race against Scott. The British were vastly amused. For their man to lose the race, he'd have to be bound and blindfolded, they said. He might as well have been. Scott was better equipped for a jaunt across the English countryside than a trek across Antarctica. To begin with, his men could barely ski, a slight disadvantage on a continent made entirely of ice and snow. Nor did Scott bring any dogs. Previous explorers advised him emphatically that his sleds must be pulled by dogs, but <laughs> Scott didn't like dogs. Instead, he put his trust in ponies. The ponies soon died. Then Scott had to put his trust in his men. Scott and his men trudged over hundreds of miles of deep snow and sheer ice. Exhausted, scurvy-ridden, and frostbitten, the proud British expedition finally reached its goal on January 17, 1912, only to find the Norwegian expedition, led by Amundsen, had arrived there a month earlier. Amundsen had a rather easy time of it and returned home without incident. 
In this rare footage, Amundsen befriends an Arctic native. But Scott didn't find the region as congenial. He and all five of his men died before they reached base, their bodies frozen solid. Scott maintained a stiff upper lip to the end. Great actors rely on instinct. When the cameras start to roll, instinct takes over. Same is true for great athletes. nothing but minor miscues compared to what Roy Regals, captain of the 1929 University of California football team, achieved. On January 1st, 1929, during a scoreless Rose Bowl game between the University of California and Georgia Tech, Cal's captain and center, Roy Regals, snatched up a Georgia Tech fumble and headed for glory. And then it happened, Regals' instincts took over. And his instincts demanded more than a mere touchdown, more than even a victory. His instincts demanded immortality. Regals turned and ran the wrong way. None of his opponents came close to tackling him. None of them wanted to, but one of his teammates finally caught up with him on his own one yard line. Georgia Tech scored on the next play and Regal's team lost the game eight to seven. Regal's play became known as the biggest blunder in football history. His immortality was assured. Sometimes people achieve fame and fortune only because of their mistakes. Douglas Corrigan was an airplane mechanic who idolized Charles Lindbergh. On July 16, 1938, Corrigan attempted a non-stop solo flight from New York to California. Friends and family waited expectantly for him on the West Coast. He didn't make it. He didn't come close. Corrigan followed the wrong end of the needle on his compass and ended up in Ireland. 7,000 miles from his original destination. By sheer accident, he'd accomplished what Lindbergh could do only after months of meticulous preparation. Long way Corrigan became an instant hero. Starting off from uh, New York uh, on Sunday morning, I started to fly to Los Angeles, but some way got turned around above the clouds, and uh, after about 26 hours of that, seeing nothing except clouds, I came down through the clouds, and uh, the country looks a little strange. And uh, I just hope that if I make any more mistakes, they'll turn out as successful as this one. <laughs> Automobile and soybean magnate Henry Ford threw a parade for Corrigan in Detroit. And without a compass to confuse him, Corrigan had no trouble leading the parade. Longway Corrigan didn't become famous just for crossing the Atlantic. Lindbergh had achieved that 11 years earlier. We honor Corrigan because he turned a dumb mistake into a triumph. Most of us aren't so lucky. The higher we reach, the harder we fall. To err is human, there's no way around it. But still, we keep trying. And sometimes, by making mistakes, we succeed. We feel sad about our failures, sure, but we shouldn't feel sorry about them. After all, the history of failure is the history of man. I'm Steve Allen.